Good afternoon. As President and Principal of Queen Mary University of London, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the magnificent setting of the People's Palace for what promises to be a truly memorable event. Queen Mary is a world-leading university with a unique past and present. Throughout our history, we have fostered social justice and improved lives through academic excellence. Today, we push the boundaries of research and innovation and provide world-class education to all students who have the potential, irrespective of their background. We are proud of the diversity of our student and staff community. We know from experience that diversity is a potent catalyst for groundbreaking ideas. We embrace this diversity of thought and opinion in everything we do, in the belief that when different views collide, disciplines interact and perspectives intersect, truly original thought takes place. And with that in mind, I am now delighted to welcome our great, to our great university a figure of whom the words groundbreaking and original thought are practically synonymous. The world-leading technologist, business leader and philanthropist, Bill Gates. to hand over to my esteemed colleague, renowned broadcaster, teacher and academic here at Queen Mary, Dr Shahida Bari. Hello Bill, <laughs> how are you? Great. Thank you for being here, welcome to Queen Mary. Um, you're in my land in East London, in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> um, I say that because it's easy to mistake my land for Davos, where I know you've been the last couple of days. I'm going to introduce you very briefly because I think nobody knows who you are here. I've tried to um, pick out some career highlights. Uh, invented Microsoft, aged eight, 19, 19? Um, arrested for speeding in a Porsche in Albuquerque in 1978. <laughs> Uh, founded the world's largest private charitable organisation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with your wife in the year 2000, and founded the Giving Pledge, along with Warren Buffett, in 2009 to encourage some of the wealthiest people in the world to give away the major part of their wealth to philanthropic courses. Um, that's a remarkable CV, even the speeding. Um, we've got a very, a very brief s slot with you, so I'm going to get to the heart of the serious questions. There was a picture of you queuing for a burger on Twitter this week that went viral. Um, I don't know if you know that you hurt our feelings, but Myland is the burger capital of the world. Um, what did you order, and would you take recommendations from our students for where to get the best burger in Myland? What did you order? Uh, it's a, a restaurant in Seattle where I is the last place I expected that a uh, viral photo would be taken. Uh, it was a deluxe, two cheeseburgers, a fry, and a medium Diet Coke. Oof. Yeah. Uh, a breakfast of champions, <laughs> that sounds like. Um, recommendations? Local Dixie burger? Chicken. Dixie chicken. <laughs> Noted, noted. Um, you got in touch with us, which was immensely flattering. You said that you wanted to talk to students. We let our students know. 700 of them signed up in 13 minutes and crashed the website Eventbrite. Well done. Um, they're keen. But why are you keen? Why are you interested in talking to students? 
Well, you know, students are the people who are open-minded and are going to shape where things go. And my sense of optimism, I think, uh, you know, talking about the possibilities of using science in the right way, I think science students are able to understand that, and they're going to go out and uh, make a, the the next set of innovations happen. Queen Mary was appealing because I'd never been here before, uh, and yet the fact that this is a research university uh, doing a lot of great work, and it's very diverse, and it's very engaged in the community, uh, I was fascinated by that. I thought it'd be a great group of kids to uh, answer questions with. We'll find out in a minute. That's a lot to live up to, guys. Um, what kind of young person were you? In case you can't remember, I think we've got a little something to nudge your memory. Is it going to come up? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of young person were you? Not very cool. Uh, <laughs> I, I loved science. I loved math. Um, I was so socially awkward. Um, I, I liked school. And um, you know, I grew up in Seattle and decided I wanted to go to the East Coast. And I ended up not finishing university because uh, the idea that uh, the microprocessor was coming and that would create this personal computer revolution, I wanted to get in on the ground floor. But I actually loved school. I mean, I could sit around late at night talking with people about all the issues of the day, uh, taking tests. I like taking tests. Uh, <laughs> so it was fun, but I ended up after two and a half years saying, no, I need to go, go start Microsoft. Eventually, they gave me an honorary degree uh, about 30 years later. So Reluctantly, uh, I'm sure. I'm sort of a dropout, sort of not <laughs> a dropout. But, uh, a, a number of our students, actually, we will get to you guys, don't worry, but a number of them asked me to ask you what you would have studied if you were an undergraduate today, what you would have majored in. Would it have been the same thing? You know, at the time, computer science wasn't a mainstream thing. And so I, my actual major was applied mathematics. Uh, the professors were fairly out of date about what was going on with the uh, computer being put onto a chip. And so uh, a lot of that work I was doing outside of school. But I really enjoyed uh, the science classes that I took. I got a bad grade, actually, in organic chemistry, because all the <laughs> pre-meds were so serious, it intimidated me. So <laughs> I, I did not get uh, a great grade in that. But just you know, young kids uh, you know, reading, thinking about the possibilities. I lived in a dorm where there was always somebody to talk to, uh, to distract you if you didn't want to do your schoolwork. Uh, you could always have a debate about something. And, uh, I was trying to be in pure mathematics because I thought that was pretty cool. And the math people kept saying to me, why aren't you doing this computer stuff, which you're really good at? Uh, and I said, well, it's not as hard as this math stuff. Uh, you know, so it's somehow uh, more interesting to challenge myself. But I ended up getting a, a chance to do, to do both. We'll get some uh, intimidating pre-med med students to ask some questions in a moment. Um, we know now that you're working on global health, on development, uh, clean energy, research into <laughs> Alzheimer's, technology. What is it that you're working on at the moment that makes you leap out of bed? What's really exciting you? Yeah, the thing that combines all the stuff I work on is investing in innovation, you know, backing uh, scientists or people in the field who have new ideas. And so, you know, even though something like making a vaccine against malaria is very daunting, we can't say when we'll get done, uh, you know, that's something that when it gets done, the benefits, the literally millions of lives that it'll save, mean that the world is kind of underinvesting. You know, when I gave my first 30 million to a malaria vaccine, I became the biggest funder, and I thought, this is mad. Yeah. Uh, you know, baldness medicines are 10 times much spent, uh, and you know, baldness doesn't kill many people. So the, you know, the market works super well uh, with a few exceptions, and the needs of the poorest, their voice in the marketplace is fairly low. And so 
the global health work has become the biggest uh, area that we do work in. And the progress in biology of understanding the genome and the microbiome and the various ways the immune system works, this is an amazing time to be backing scientists. And because governments have helped fund delivery even into the, the poorest countries, we have a way that we can go pretty quickly from something that gets invented to getting out uh, to lots and lots of people. So my global health work is the one that uh, even I'm surprised, I'm an, I'm an optimist, I like that things happen quickly, but the number of lives we've been able to save by partnering with the ritual governments, including the UK, which is very generous in these areas, uh, I never would have expected. Some of the other areas like improving education or Alzheimer's uh, uh, or uh, some of the climate change related work, you know, that hasn't paid off yet. And so I'm kind of laying seeds that you have to be patient. A lot of these things take 10 or even 15 years to get done. But funding innovation, uh, that's my favorite thing. But it strikes me that so many of these causes, you feel urgently about them. They are urgent. How do you decide? You're, I mean, you've dedicated the, the giving pledges about making your contribution. And I imagine you sit down with advisors and think deeply about how to distribute those funds, what to back. How do you make those decisions between malaria or tackling plastic waste? Walk, walk me through the process a bit. Well, there's definitely uh, an analytic numeric framework that you can apply to this. Uh, I have to admit, though, that it was almost the story of injustice that really drew me in at first. What, we, what I saw was there was an article uh, that my wife and I looked at that said 500,000 people, kids, are dying of diarrhea a year. And I thought, well, that just can't be true. Why would I just be reading that for the first time? Uh, and why wouldn't the world have done something about that? And then as we looked into it, it was even worse, which was that there was a, a vaccine called rotavirus vaccine that kids in middle-income and rich countries were getting. And the kids in the poor countries, where they had 20 times the chance of dying of this uh, diarrheal disease, they weren't getting the vaccine. And so I had been thinking, okay, I'm going to fund people to create new vaccines, but the fact that there was a vaccine that was already invented yeah. but wasn't getting out, that seemed just wild. And, you know, why weren't people yelling and outraged and, uh, and various things? So that was uh, in the year 2000, which is, as you said, that's when I started uh, to give part-time to the foundation work. It was 2008 before I uh, stopped working full-time at Microsoft, and so now that's about 15%. That's a part-time thing, where the foundation <laughs> is my sort of 100% uh, yeah. thing, which adds up to more than 100%. 115%. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so one of the first things was working with other governments. Actually, the UK is the biggest donor to it, to finance those vaccines, to get the companies to provide them at uh, essentially the marginal cost, uh, which started out at about $4, but now is less than a dollar uh, as they uh, improve their manufacturing process and get those out to kids. So that's worked way better than I expected, and it's actually created now the capacity for these new things to come through. That work, uh, to answer your question, is saving lives for less than $1,000. And for every life you save, there's four kids who would have survived but would have been permanently damaged uh, by the disease. That is, they wouldn't, in terms of their physical height or mental development, uh, have uh, achieved much capacity. Also, as you improve health, uh, this is another thing that took us a while to discover, as you improve health, families choose to have less children because right. the chance of their kids surviving goes up, and so they decide, okay, they don't need to have six, they can have five, four, and, and so any country that you improve health in, very quickly that population growth rate, growth rate goes down. So it's almost paradoxical that the more kids you save, the less pressure there is on the environment and you know, providing jobs and stability, which particularly in the poor countries is a huge problem. And so that cause, global health, it, everything else you do uh, better be damn effective because 
by not spending that $1,000, you're, you're not doing the measles campaign that would go out there and, and save someone. So I do a lot of other things, but it has to be, I really have to believe that the catalytic effect, say, of innovations to reduce climate change uh, will be so uh, uh, incredibly impactful that I, I can feel okay about uh, not spending everything on just that one cause. I do think, in general, people are driven more by stories. Now, so once you get in and decide what you're going to give money to, you should then be very numerical. But, you know, if a relative is sick or you, you know, we try to get a lot of people to go uh, to these countries because uh, you can't come back without being affected by the fact that such a small amount of resource can have such a, a fundamental benefit. Well, can I ask you about maths again? <laughs> um, the, the report from Oxfam last week, um, which I think lots of us were really, uh, it's a very ar arresting statistic, this research released by Oxfam, that uh, the t there are 26 single people in the, the top, among the top billionaires who earn as much as the poorest 50% of the population. Um, and I think if you ask someone in the street to name one of those 26, you are one of those people that they would be able to recognize and pick out of a lineup, which, which, makes, me <laughs> um, which makes me think that, you know, I mean, lots of those people are shadowy and we don't know who they are and they don't want to have a public profile, whereas you are the public face, both of the success of the 26 and the face of that inequality. So I wonder, what do you say when people ask, what do we do about that inequality? Well, certainly, it is unusual uh, that you have people with so much money. Um, you know, it, uh, and there's an element of, of luck, uh, and you know, my skills in terms of timing and what I'm good at just happen to line up where uh, Microsoft got in early, did some work, and I'm very proud of that work. I'm not, you know, I feel that uh, improved the world, empowered people in lots of ways. Now, if you look at it on a consumption basis, which is in a, in a way, it's another frame, you know, I don't eat that many more hamburgers uh, or wear that many more sweaters or shoes. Uh, yes, I, I get to travel quite a bit, but in a way, that's the real comparison should be that the poorest aren't able to have uh, food security and a good education. And if we can get wealthy people to be more generous, I mean, first of all, we should have more progressive taxation that takes more of those fortunes and gets them in, into government coffers. And in the US where I'm a voter and understand the tax system, you know, I'm always pushing for the estate tax to be more. And I've paid over 10 billion in taxes, but uh, there's quite a bit left over. After that, um, <laughs> but the idea that if you have wealthy people who are picking causes that help those most in need, at least in a small way, that addresses yeah. that issue that we want everybody to have the basics. Now, capitalism is a system that creates incentives and you know, it's worked other systems. You can go to Venezuela or North Korea and see, you know, do these other systems work? This system certainly can be tuned for increased ex equity by improving those tax structures. And you know, if all of the rich were engaged in substantial philanthropy, giving away the majority of their wealth, you know, my claim is not only would society be better off, but they personally, and even their children, where inheriting you know, gigantic sums of wealth is actually not that beneficial uh, to a kid's sense of self uh, contribution and understanding, uh, you know, what they are going to contribute to the world. So it is a little strange. So that what, what that statistic relies on is that basically there's a lot of people in the world who uh, don't have many assets at all. So the bottom 50% yeah. is, you know, sadly, you know, an emergency comes along, they don't have much. I always think it's funny, though, when they count that number, how do they count my wife? Where is she? <laughs> Is yeah. she in the bottom 50%? Because they, they give all the money to me, yeah. uh, or my son, or anyway. Yeah. So it's That's a, a tough conversation a bit, over the breakfast table. A little bit of an yeah. exaggeration <laughs> uh, to attribute in, the, in that way. And I think people should look at that consumption, because when we really feel bad about wealth, it's that lack of security uh, that uh, 
is, is really prominent. That's, I think, more the measure than a pure Gini coefficient, you know, let's try what Venezuela is doing. Yeah. Um, when, we, when we announced that you were coming to visit us here, a number of people thought it was a scam. Fake news, they said. I think we even reported the email from your lovely private office person, Bridget, as a phishing email <laughs> at one point. Um, but fake news, have you been thinking about our culture of disinformation, online especially? Are you thinking about, about I and mean, I'm interested in where you get your news from. Well, I read trusted publications. Uh, there's two London-based publications that are two of my favorite. The FT, Financial Times, uh, is very good on the business front. And The Economist, uh, you know, I read every word every week. I'm looking forward to getting mine later, this week's <laughs> later today. Uh, you know, those are great publications. And I, you know, friends are always showing me links to various articles uh, that are out there. Yes, it is a concern. The, you know, everyone who was involved in <coughs> the creation of the internet was a bit naive that there would just be this flourishing of correct information. And the idea that the ease of publishing would mean that the average quality of what was published would tend towards the more hysterical or what confirmed beliefs you had, even if it wasn't true, we missed that. And now the world is you know, saying, OK, what should governments do about yeah. that? What should companies do about that? And this is a, a serious problem. I mean, there literally have been ethnic unrest where digital communication, although net, I still view it as very beneficial, uh, certain uh, mob-like behavior uh, in countries was facilitated by digital communication. And, and, you know, so what should the rules be? And can we get software to sit there and filter? And how does that connect to free speech? Yeah. You know, I don't think we're going to have the computer looking and say, okay, this isn't factual, I'll delete it. Um, because we want to have open and free discourse. And of course, saying that people were always factual in the past, uh, you know, that's not not really true. Politicians have always had yeah. uh, a loose connection with uh, truthful statements. I think that's true. And, you know, so, it, but the trend is worrying. The, the polarization, the uh, fact that voters are kind of unhappy and, and viewing a vote as kind of a protest uh, type thing. And then the circulation where some people are listening to one set of facts and other people to another set of facts. Uh, these are challenges for your generation to contemplate. And you know, some of you come up with what should the rules be, what kind of leadership do we need to make sure that innovation, uh, particularly the digital innovation, uh, we reduce the, the, the negative things that are coming out of it today. Yeah. Um, Bill, this was the easy bit. Are you ready for the real interrogation? <laughs> <laughs> Let's turn out to our QM students. So the first question is from Ram Joshi, who's in Electronic Engineering and Computer Science. So Ram, what's your question? Can you hold the mic right up to your mouth? Uh, what do you think is the most pressing issue that us young people should be focusing on going into the near future? Well, I do think, you know, there's quite a list you could make. Uh, in terms of uh, you know things like climate change, uh, which you know is a global problem, or being prepared if a pandemic uh, comes along, I do think the thing that rises to the top of the list is um, part of the equality agenda of making sure that the health and education that we provide to everybody is you know reaches a a reasonable standard. And even in rich countries, we fall far short of that. Uh, and certainly, if you get out to the poorer countries, where you still have lots of kids who aren't uh, going to school at all, and uh, you, know, you have parts of Africa where 20% of the kids are dying before the age of five, and half of the survivors uh, don't you know, can't uh, ever be educated because they don't, they don't have enough development. So that, I still think of health and education as the two primary pr 
promises that we aspire to uh, for all people. And, and so contributing to that, uh, I, I'd put at the top of the list. Uh, Renata Davidson Klungland from Law, I think she's lost her voice today, sadly. So her question, I'm going to read it for Renata, if she doesn't mind. Uh, what are the problems that we could feasibly solve in the next 10 years? Well, 10 years, um, 10 years is an okay time frame. And I'd prefer to have 20. Uh, there are things like m malaria eradication. Uh, malaria still was killing a million children a year uh, 15 years ago. Now it's killing a half million a year of the six million who died before the age of five. It's a half million that, but it was 12 million a year back in 1990. So we've cut it in half, which is one of those amazingly positive statistics that most people don't know because the news uh, is better at, at carrying the bad news than the, the good news. You know, in 10 years, I, you know, I don't think we'll have an Alzheimer's cure. Uh, that may take 20. Uh, a, a set of ways of helping you control your satiety so that we go after obesity and diabetes. I do think uh, that one's probably in the 20 year uh, time frame. Uh, figuring out how software can, in, can play a positive role in education. You know, for 30 or 40 years, they've talked about, okay, we'll put computers in the schools. And, and yet, to date, in terms of really helping uh, less motivated, lower income students really engage, the computer hasn't had a big effect. It's been a nice tool for the motivated to look at videos and look up articles. And, and, and so if you really want to learn, you know, I'm on there uh, gaining knowledge of uh, tons and tons of subjects, but uh, it hasn't really helped in a, broad, in a broad sense. So I do think in the next 10 years, we'll finally get that get that right and, and use it to draw students in, uh, certainly on the basic skills like math, reading and writing. Orla Dowling from the Department of Geography. Where's Orla? Uh, what advice would you give to someone who is really passionate about their business idea but doesn't have the funds to set it up in the way that they would like to? is passionate about. Uh, their business idea, but doesn't have the funds to set it up as they would like to. Well, um, you know, the career path that people take, um, there's a lot of options. You know, often going to work at a big company for a period of time is a very good thing in terms of understanding, you know, budgeting, marketing, finance, investing, you know, meeting other smart people that when you do finally go start your company, you can bring them along. And, you know, so five or six years in a well-run uh, private sector company can be the thing that sets you up. Now, if your idea, if somebody else is going to take your idea really quickly, then maybe that's, uh, you, don't, you don't have time for that. But most things, uh, you know, being, getting to the point where you can do it well, the mythic thing is the you know, college dropout who makes a lot of money. And I worry that, that uh, the success rate of that happening isn't super high. That's a good message uh, for us so, to have so, you say. <laughs> so I definitely encourage everyone to finish college. I think I set a, a poor example uh, in, in, that, in that respect. And even this, this idea of you know, maybe going to business school or, or going out you know, to a mainstream job, those are often the very best entrepreneurs because they really refined their idea and developed a, a broader set of skills. Now, I was lucky enough to hire in a lot of experienced people uh, so that as Microsoft grew, I had great finance people and uh, I understood the engineering and the software, but everything about sales and marketing, finance, I brought in people who were, you know, even 20 years older than I was once I got brave enough to think, okay, I. I I'm not going to fail to pay their salary, which always scared me that these people who had kids and uh, were moving their families to come work for me, would, would the business uh, mean that someday I had to tell them I wasn't going to pay them? So I was very conservative in terms of having money in the bank. Uh, I always had enough to pay everybody for a year, even if our, our customers stopped paying us. 
So we'll look out for your business idea, Orla. Finish school, that sounds like. Uh, <laughs> Anna Goncharenko. Uh, where's Anna? Hello? Wow. Um, I've got a question about education. And uh, so one of the limitations of the education system is that it does not foster creativity a lot of the time. And one can infer that in an environment of standardized testing and mundane routines, there is no room for innovation. Or is there? Um, so how do we change the school system in a way uh, to nurture originality and creativity, uh, but without losing um, organization? Yeah. yeah I I'm a huge proponent of trying things that make learning more interesting, like project-based learning where you're forced to integrate your knowledge across a number of domains and uh, try to get things done, or where you explore you know, big questions like exoplanetary life, where you'd have to learn chemistry and biology and uh, astronomy in order to put those things together. Despite that, though, I still believe in tests, because the you know, being able to answer questions on a test is not, in a well-designed test, it's just a regurgitation of facts. You know, if you understand calculus, if you understand economics, uh, chemistry, physics, you know, the idea that, hey, I'm going to be tested, so I've really got to get my uh, thoughts together. You know, they've done lots of experiments where people take a class, and some people know they're going to be tested, and are tested, some people are told they're gonna to be tested and they're not tested. Uh, and anyway, the idea that you're going to be tested was a huge uh, differentiator in terms of how well people absorbed the knowledge. And particularly if you go back two years later, the people who were tested knew it better. So we're gonna to have to get, encourage creativity. The, I don't think those tests are the things that uh, are against creativity, I think it's making the subject interesting. You know, uh, biology uh, in my high school was the most boring subject, and only when I became an adult did I realize, actually, that was a really interesting subject, the diversity of life and what we know about species. God knows I might not have gone into computer engineering if I'd had a, a really good biology uh, <laughs> teacher. And now, as an adult, a lot of the research I'm funding and you know, I get a chance to meet with scientists working in, in that area, so I, I have almost as much experience in that, not quite as much as in, uh, in computer science. So making stuff interesting, uh, I think, is still a question. The very best teachers do it well. Uh, there's a thing called the Great Course of the Learning Company where you can get these DVDs, uh, kind of an antiquated approach uh, <laughs> and watch incredible professors teach nice. courses and the best are so make the subject so interesting uh, and you know so we need to spread those best practices and particularly in the high school the quality of the teacher in terms of making you want to do well and explaining that hey this subject seems complicated but actually there's only a few basic concepts and then it'll all fall into line a good teacher makes things simpler uh, than, an, than an average teacher. Was it, weren't your own high school days unusual? Weren't you building a computer instead of being at your English classes? And I'm, I'm imagining having a student like Bill Gates in your class must have been quite a handful. Yeah, the, I was very lucky. I went to a, um, quite a good school. I remember when my parents said, hey, we want you to go to this private school, I thought, should I fail the exam or not? Uh, <laughs> because, you know, maybe would that be a fun place to be? When I first got there, people wore uniforms. Uh, it was almost like a British boarding school. Uh, it was an imitation of it. But then I met a few really good teachers, including the, the math teacher, uh, not the biology teacher, the chemistry <laughs> teacher. And it really drew me in. And I, I love to read. The funny thing that happened was then the computer showed up. And this, it wasn't actually a computer, it was a terminal where you called over a phone line to a big computer that was very expensive. And a few of the teachers made a mistake and spent $300 by having a program that was an infinite loop. You used to have to pay for computer time. Uh, <laughs> and so the teachers never went in there ever again. And so this 
computer terminal was there for us to go in, the students, and you know, I, I, I skipped gym all the time uh, <laughs> because this computer became sort of a, an addiction, and, and a kid who was two years older than me, Paul Allen, because I was really good at math, he said, oh, I challenge you to figure this computer out. You know, you think you can figure anything out. And I thought, well, can I? I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, so it, it was really cool, and it was right at the time. And so I was one of the few people that at age, you know, 13 to 17, I had a, you know, very intense, you know, greater than 10,000 hour type exposure to, to programming. And that's how you became Bill Gates. Uh, Ariana Cervantes from the Blizzard Institute of Medicine and Dentistry. Hi, Ariana. Hi, thank you, Mr. Gates. Um, so my question for you is, what is a piece of advice a mentor gave you that stuck with you over the years? Yeah, the, you know, a really good mentor uh, helps you get a realistic assessment of where you're strong and where you're not and you know, helps you set goals that are kind of achievable so you'll feel like a real sense of progress. There's this whole discussion now about learning mindset that that didn't exist, um, but I, I think it's a very profound idea, is that you ought to reward yourself for hard effort. You know, yes, you can get a bad grade on something, that's a, a learning experience. A lot of people, get discouraged, and I think one of the assets I had, including mentors who helped with this, was that, you know, I always thought, oh shoot, I, I don't understand this, uh, but I can, um, and, you know, I just haven't read enough or tried hard enough. I had several points where I thought I was really good at programming, and then I met somebody who was way better, that I would look at their code and realize, whoops, uh, you know, there's a whole new level of excellence here. And that kind of exposure to people who love the craft and were willing to, uh, you know, kind of say to me, hey, you need to do this better. And, you know, mentorship, a lot of it is uh, uh, helping you not go down some ba bad pathways uh, and, and having encouragement. So I had that in high school. When I went to uh, Harvard, I remember I went into an advisor and he, he said I was precocious. And in my household I grew up in, that was an insult that you were, it was always precocious brat. Uh, and so I went into this advisor and he said I was precocious. And I, oh man, I must have really offended this guy. So I had to go look up the word to understand actually only in my household was that a, 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 an insult that uh, uh, I, I was precocious. And, you know, my behavior was extreme in terms of really wanting to use the computer, and my parents didn't like that. In the end, it worked out. Uh, but if you'd asked them at the, the time, still out on that bill. <laughs> they would have been like, no, he's going to be, he's never going to be able to talk to people, uh, which it, when I was young, I wasn't good at that. But uh, so letting people kind of run with their passions. Uh, uh, and particularly when you're young and you're, you know, under 30, boy, can you learn things. Um, and if you keep pushing yourself, you can retain some of that. But you are, all of you are in the age where you can learn so much. Uh, this is the period of time where your greatest skills, the areas that you're really going to be super good at, will be laid down. That's pretty great for you guys, huh? Yeah. Um, do you still code at all? No. No. Is it, that's, I that was in done. my 30s. <laughs> I was 38 uh, when I wrote my last piece of code. Now, I do tons of architecture. I write memos about how we should use AI. You know, I study quantum computing AI. So I'm still very technical. And I'll write goofy little programs just to mess around. But in terms of shipping products from Microsoft, uh, I haven't written code for an age, uh, like about the time you were born. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you've been busy nonetheless. Uh, Aaron Brady from Law. Is Aaron here? Hi, Aaron. So in 1994, you paid $30 million for Leonardo da Vinci's notebook. And I was wondering, how do you think future generations will remember you, and how would you like to be remembered? 
and what item of yours will be most likely to achieve a record um, bid at auction 600 years from now? Good question. Yeah, probably that picture of me buying a cheeseburger. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a masterpiece. Uh, caught me unawares at my best. Uh, you know, da Vinci lived at a time when you could be truly polymathic. That is, you could be uh, knowledgeable about all the sciences and literally actually contribute. And so whether it was perspective or color or optics or music or medicine or designing weapons or making clever plays, which actually uh, was the main thing he got paid to do because there was an a ar aristocratic market for it, he was just mind-blowing, and his curiosity, and he was completely off by himself. He had this strange status where he was the son of a noble, but the bastard son of a noble. So he couldn't go to school, but they couldn't make him work. Uh, so he would just walk around in the forest and look at uh, things. Uh, and then he did apprentice himself to become an artist, but very quickly out, outgrew his master, both in painting and and sculpture and, and scientific things. So anyway, owning this notebook uh, was a strange thing. I said to my wife, I'm gonna buy a notebook, and uh, I said, it's gonna cost $30 million. She was like, whoa, that must be a great notebook. Uh, anyway, it's toured around quite a bit, and it's very inspirational. The particular notebook I bought, uh, he's studying water and how water flows and trying to understand light and water and if you dam water why does it make various patterns anyway really phenomenal stuff in fact he talks about why how the heart works and it's only uh, about 20 years ago they finally proved he was right in terms of how the heart drives uh, circulation really? wow. unfortunately his stuff wasn't published in his time so the world had to rediscover almost these notebooks were kind of obscure the Duke of Lichtenstein. I can never pronounce that, owned it forever. Uh, and then an American bought it, and then uh, Armand Hammer, and then he died. Uh, and I, I got it at auction after that. You know, I, I don't think in terms of people remembering me, you know, it's a very, it would be a very strange thing to live your life uh, to improve how you're thought of once you're dead. Um, and so, you know, it's best probably to ignore that and simply you know, gather the opinions of people you want to like you or uh, even more stringently, people you want to love you and that you love and say, you know, am I a good father? Or are you proud of the work I'm doing? Or you know, do I seem to be getting uh, better at uh, the things that I've, I've set goals to improve on? And you know, that idea of the... Uh, the people around you who you really care about, that's a pretty good test because they're, they've seen you behave in, in tough situations and you know, they don't get this impression that you're really good at everything. Uh, they know you're not. Uh, and so it, you know, I may or may not be remembered. You know, like in the history of personal computing, I know there were a thousand people who contributed to it. Because nobody's going to learn all those names, the Walter Isaacson book does a good job trying to uh, you know, show how many people contributed. The simplistic view that Steve Jobs and I were some meaningful percentage of the innovative work, that's a gross simplification, you know, which overstates my, his role and my role quite a bit. But oh well, um, you know, people don't have time to learn for every field of endeavor what a collaborative incremental enterprise it was. So the idea, uh, you know, the chip people and the opti fiber optics people, anyway, um, and, and so the, you're not going to live to be in that oversimplified thing. My children, you know, I hope they remember me well because, uh, you know, I put a lot of effort into trying to set them up uh, to live, live a fulfilling life. And that's, a, you know, that's about it. Uh, that's you know, sort of the, 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 at, the litmus test. Thank you. Tom Ray from Bart's, one of our medics. Hi, Tom. Okay. Thank you for coming. Um, as an aspiring medic, I've watched your ongoing work on improving sanitation, treating dementia, and the eradication of polio with great interest. Considering your ongoing philanthropic involvement in healthcare, are there any major global public health issues 
and are likely to present a challenge in 20 to 30 years, but are yet to become widely acknowledged? Well, the, the one that uh, is super, super underinvested in, although I'm optimistic, is malnutrition. Uh, that it you know, turns out that kids who have limited diets, their uh, microbiome uh, gets into an inflammatory state and they're not able to absorb nutrition, and that becomes a chronic thing. So you can have two twins, one will grow up stunted, one eating the exact same diet will fully develop. So there's a cascade of events that we think um, we can intervene in a fairly simple way. So I'd put malnutrition up very high. For the rich world, overnutrition, obesity, uh, is this growing thing which, of course, uh, drives a lot of the uh, why heart attacks are still a huge problem, so even to some degree cancer, but particularly diabetes. And the question of, okay, satiety, why, when do you stop eating and why, it's only now that the complex circuits that literally do go somewhat through uh, microbiome chemical uh, uh, transmission, we are getting our minds around that. We ought to be able to come up with interventions for it. But the things like prematurity, you know, our foundation has had to really lead the way in research on that because strangely the rich world researchers, even though it's still a, a great tragedy and not well explained, even some ethnic differences in uh, prevalence of, of, uh, of prematurity, anyway, we are starting to get some really deep insights in it. The tools of biology where you can sequence things and uh, um, understand not just the static sequence but dynamically what's going on and where there's all these data analysis tools partly from the whole AI big data world, means that you're living in a 20 or 30 year period where the advances will be incredible. And, and people are so underestimating people broadly how important and how valuable uh, those advances uh, will be. So I, I still put malnutrition at the top, even though the top 10 includes HIV vaccine, TB vaccine, uh, Sophie Harmon, who's one of our academics in politics, she works on, on global health and I think she's engaged with your foundation and she wanted to, uh, me to ask you about um, your commitment to improving maternal health and reproduct reproductive rights in particular. And she wondered, how do you start a conversation with world leaders who are limiting women's access to reproductive health? And I think that's part of a broader question about how, you, how do you how do you strong arm people? How do you persuade people to see the world as you're seeing it? Well, the access to contraception is a huge um, priority for the foundation. And my wife, Linda, is very, very passionate about that. You know, all the trips she makes, she's out asking women, okay, what were you told? Do you have access? Does it work for you? How do you think about the side effects? What are the social norms? Is your husband accepting of your choices in this area? You know, how could we make a, a contraceptive that would be uh, more attractive, maybe last longer, less side effects, more covert? Uh, and you know, it should be kind of a right that a, a woman can have access to contraception. Contraception is somewhat controversial, which seems weird. Abortion, which we're not uh, involved in, is more controversial, particularly in the United States. So we're, you know, we're willing to take on any constituency who says contraception is not a good thing. My wife is Catholic. The Catholic Church says you know, people aren't supposed to use contraception, but in fact, you know, 80% of Catholics use contraception. So. Uh, you know, the church is reasonably slow at changing its uh, framework, um, but hopefully it will because there's huge benefits. Uh, you know, using condoms is a very good thing to avoid HIV and other sexual disease transmission. So, you know, we, we bought a lot of condoms uh, <laughs> and we're doing amazing work in, in contraception. The market for contraceptive tools is small enough and the liability risks are high enough that the commercial companies have largely not done much in the last 20 years, so we've had to kind of reignite that. Uh, but it, you know, it's 
if a woman chooses to limit births or uh, does birth spacing, that's associated with great improvements uh, both in the child's health and in the mother's health. Mother, uh, maternal mortality, you know, a lot of it's having to do with um, bleeding or access to C-sections. Uh, you know, we're creating now these super low cost ultrasound uh, evaluations that uh, let you know, are you going to have a complicated birth early enough that if so, you can go and get access to a doctor who can do something like a C-section. So there's, there's a lot of hope that we'll be able to cut maternal mortality in half by 2030. I think that we're all behind that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Yasmin Ahmed from the Electronic Engineering and Computer Science School. Is Yasmin here? Hi, so my question is, given all your success um, over the years, what has been your biggest failure and what have you learned from it? That's quite a harsh question to ask No, someone. it's a great question. <laughs> uh, when we started our foundation, we said, okay, let's do two things. Let's do global health because the, the injustice of it, it is so great uh, and it isn't getting the attention it deserves. And we also decided the other big thing would be improving the education system in the United States and then taking whatever lessons we learned once that was successful and taking them to other countries. We naively thought that improving the uh, you know, math and reading capabilities of U.S. students by looking at what good teachers did and uh, helping other teachers access that understanding or using some technology thing. But, you know, just simply bringing the average teacher up to the top 25 percent would have been very dramatic. So we thought our U.S. education work that we'd have great big results in that and global health because it was you know, in stable countries and corrupt politicians and far away, that in our first 10 years, maybe that wouldn't go well, but the U.S. education thing would have us so cheered up yeah. that we would stick to it and eventually it would do well. What actually happened is the opposite of that. In our first 10 years, you know, by getting rotavirus vaccine out to lots of children and coming together with donors like the U.K. government to create Gavi and Global Fund, we had way more impact than we'd even expected in 20 years, uh, partly because the field was neglected. It's, uh, uh, but in U.S. education, although in many schools we improved things a lot for a period of time, our ability to take uh, getting feedback to teachers and improving mentorship and a variety of things we did, the ability to get that to scale out to lots of schools uh, that uh, weren't our initial focus, and to make it last even when the principal, superintendent, union person, you know, politicians changed, uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't last because it had to do with ranking and giving feedback in a way that they, uh, what just didn't sustain itself and didn't scale. And so edu improving education uh, is our, our great failure, and yet uh, we're not giving up. Uh, that is, it's so important. And strangely, if you look at different areas of human activity, and you say, okay, what's the R&D percentage for making new drugs, or what's the R&D percentage for clean energy? Uh, the, the area you'd expect there to be a higher and deep percentage for is education, to really study that great teacher or that curriculum that seems to do better and understand what's going on there. And yet, um, a, a doctor today is better than a doctor 50 years ago. Even the best doctor 50 years ago is as good as Dr. Day. But if I said to you the best math teacher was somebody who taught 100 years ago, you couldn't prove me wrong. Mm. I mean, they're you know, chalkboard and chalk, you know, which actually worked 100 years ago, uh, they might have been more inspirational, given better examples and feedback and been more motivational than any teacher alive today. So the state of the art, um, particularly if you look at the average capability, hasn't changed. Our, our understanding is not dramatically advanced. And so uh, it, 
I do believe that society under under invests at understanding these things. So we're going to keep trying. It's about 20 percent of the money we spend, about a billion a year, is still going into this. And there's parts like scholarships that we do that clearly those are great. But the idea of improving the quality of teaching, uh, it's it it's eluded us today. I think you'll find the secret here at Queen Mary. <laughs> um, a question from Nicholas Brown from Economics. Is Nicholas here? Hi. Hi. Um, so I heard in a recent interview that if you were to do it all again, you would do it with artificial intelligence. So I'm kind of wondering how you would go about it, like what your approach be, and how do you think AI will just in the near future. Yeah, the term AI uh, has been around for a long, long time. In my early years, you know, that was already the holy grail of computer science. That is to match certain human abilities. And we started out trying to match uh, the ability to recognize speech, to listen, essentially human ear, and the the human eye, the ability to see and, and recognize things. And in fact, on those sensory tasks in the last decade, as lots of compute power and the techniques of deep learning have been applied, now computers on most ways you would objectively score are better at listening and better at seeing than humans are. Now, there are very important things, human capabilities, uh, some are, which are very measurable in a concrete way that AI uh, has made essentially no progress on. If you, the, you know, the human arm uh, with the fingers and feedback and all that, there's a lot of people working on it, uh, but they don't have anything to match that. So if you say to a computer, go into a room, you know, make the bed, clean it up, uh, you know, that, uh, is, is way beyond what the computer can do. The other one, which to me is the most interesting, is that if you give a textbook to a computer, say a biology textbook, uh, and you give it the biology test, it, it will fail. If you say, you know, is the word um, nucleus in this book, of course, it'll very quickly tell you all the pages. But in the sense that when you read that book, you learn about a cell and uh, you know, eukaryotes are, are different. Um, it, it can't do it. It doesn't have a knowledge representation. And so that holy grail of being able to read and understand, like humans does, that's not there. Now companies, you know, Microsoft, many are working on this and knowing how will that be solved in five years, 10 years, 20 years, um, you know, I'm optimistic because I think we're, uh, there's some good ideas uh, being worked on, but uh, it, it's eluded us, and I think it will be quite a valuable thing. Uh, and, you know, so to me, that's, that's the next frontier and the thing of great interest uh, that those of you who are in computer science can help help solve. Have you seen, there's a YouTube video of a, a young woman sat in front of some form of AI and it's a robotic arm and it's trying to feed her her breakfast and it pours the milk over her and the cereal goes flying. It's, I mean, it reassures me, people like me who are scared of um, the computer in Terminator, it reassures me that artificial intelligence isn't there. But I'm worried that Bill Gates is worried about super intelligence. Yeah, I'm worried about that. <laughs> uh, it's not it's not coming anytime soon. The, eventually, the things that we worried about, like having enough to eat or sickness, um, those things society will be able to provide without having everybody working on them. And the advance in AI is simply going to increase productivity where a lot of the jobs initially the manual jobs, but eventually even some others, can be done without taking the time of the humans. So the question of, as we're freed up in time, what 
what does matter, what does count, uh, what is the sense of purpose, particularly for young people, that they can latch on to, what is the organizing principle, there will eventually be this world of excess. That's not the world we live in today. We live in a world of shortage. If anybody thinks we don't live in a world of shortage, you can just go to Africa and look at the, you know, the need for clinicians or you know, basic teaching to get done there. Uh, but you know, sometime in the 20 to 100 year time frame, that will flip over. And it will be an interesting challenge, almost a philosophical challenge of purpose that we will have solved the things, you know, initially we were all subsistence farmers, and so now we've come a little bit past that, but we still need most people to work, you know, most of their tw age 20 to 60 in order to have enough stuff. And when that's no longer necessary, then our sense of values will have to evolve, uh, including being in a world where the computers are, are very, very smart. Mildly terrified by that. One last question from Jenya Verma, and it's quick, and I think the answer might be quick too. Jenya Verma? Yeah. Hi. Hi. I didn't think they'd let me ask you this. And I don't really require a lot for you to speak. Once I saw in a video that you could jump over a standing chair, right? <laughs> and I wonder when was the last time you did that? And could you still? I have to tell you, this story about jumping over the chair, your private office, Bridget, your assistant said, please don't let him do it. And I think the principal is worried about having to airlift you to the Royal London Hospital. So you don't have to do it, but could you still do it? I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I play a fair bit of tennis. I go uh, snow skiing some. I could jump over that table. That would be easy. Uh, <laughs> but I, it used to be, and I have done it literally for 15 years, that I would take like a garbage can and can you from a standing start jump in and jump out. And if you ski a lot, that's sort of the uh, uh, a thing that you, you want to be well exercised in doing. But no, I, I bet I can't uh, <laughs> at this age. Although this chair is not, not that high, but I, I, I don't think I'll attempt it. Some things have to remain a mystery. One uh, last question. Um, millennials, Generation Z here, uh, I think they get a lot of criticism for being entitled, for being precious being thin-skinned, hung up on social media, and if we believe the scientists, they're up, up for, a, they're facing a tough time. Do you think that they're well-equipped for the future? Well, I think it's anything where people are trying to characterize an entire generation is, you know, very strange. You know, that's like characterizing an ethnic group or something where it's, you know, more uh, confusing than it is, is helpful. I think the people at your age who've been lucky enough to get to go to college, you know, that this is the, the opportunities you'll have, the improvements you'll see, the type of jobs you'll get to do will be fantastic. I mean, yes, there's lots of things to worry about. You know, will the politicians mess everything up? Uh, hopefully some of you will go be a new generation of politicians. We do need smart people to go into politics. I didn't choose to do it, but some of you need to uh, help us out on that, on that front. Take a longer term view of things, not uh, create some of the problems that, that we're in right now. Actually, you know, I'd say our deficit, all the scientific stuff I'm talking about, yeah, the more people who work on it, the better, the quicker we solve Al Alzheimer's, the better. But I know that uh, it's just a question of when. In terms of certain of these political issues, like does the, you know, trying to achieve equality divide us so much in terms of, okay, what about trade? What about immigration? What about taxation? That we end up uh, not being productive and you know, we're always in turmoil within a country or between countries, like you know, between the US and China. I'm a little bit concerned about that. And I don't know if that's just because I'm older and thinking, well, things were better when I was young or because really the politicians are a bit uh, lower quality today <laughs> than uh, they were in the past. But at least I, I, I hope some of the IQ and energy here goes into that political realm and helps the, the fact-based dialogue and the 
uh, you know, the win-win type innovation uh, that can take place even in tough areas like equality or, or climate change or being able to stop, uh, stop pandemics. So it's a, you know, this is a great generation to kind of look and criticize the, the things that we haven't done uh, and hopefully not, you know, make the same mistakes that are being made today. We've got one minute left with Bill, and Bill has asked to take a selfie with you guys. I don't know if you're up for it. Are you up for it? Yeah. So we'll do our best. But I think you have to reward him with a tremendous round of applause afterwards. Okay. Okay. How do you want us? Crowd in. Everybody wave. <laughs> Fantastic. Couple more. All right. Wonderful. Please join me in thanking the marvellous, inspiring Bill Gates.